Hey everybody, welcome into Body Time. Harry McCullough here. We're going to spend a little time with Tanner McGee. Of course, he's the state representative from District 53. He's here to kind of give us any updates, maybe do a year in review as we get ready for some cold weather here down the bayou for sure. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for being with us and we appreciate it. So let's wrap up the year kind of, it was, it was a heck of a year, I guess. It was a lot. I mean, you know, uh, he, we had COVID coming off of that and then coming off of Ida. So it was kind of our, our, our recovery year. People got together again. I mean, you right. had to go to places. Um, and as far as the state saw, you, you, we saw it in the budget actually, because you had a lot of activity. And so state revenues are up by right. a lot, which my time in office, they've been <laughs> down the whole time. So it's this really weird position to kind of like have money. Another special session. Another special <laughs> session, right. So, you know, we, we actually are going to finish a billion dollars over expectations. So we're, we're wow. in the black a billion dollars, um, which was completely, I don't want to say unexpected because we knew with Ida and the recovery that there'd be a bump, but I don't think we, we were projecting a billion dollar surplus. Right. So the economy's doing better than expected. Everything's kind of better than we were anticipating. So it's kind of a, a different place to be in. Yeah. So optimism there, but pessimism a little bit with inflation and with insurance. Yeah. So, you know, every every night it seems like on the local news we see, oh, another insurance company's bailing out. You, you see the Commissioner Donlin saying, well, we're going to be all right. We still got people. But it, it seems like it's happening more and more. Yeah, no, we have we have a, a I think it's fair to say we do have an insurance crisis in Louisiana um, from a, from a standpoint of insurance companies leaving the market. I think from the standpoint of insurance companies not necessarily always doing what they're supposed to do. Not all of them. We don't want to blame every insurance sure. company. There's a lot of good insurance companies that try their best. But we, we are seeing it where. Um, insurance companies are not are not paying out what they should pay out for people on claims. Um, you know, I, I saw yesterday where um, farmers said they would write policies in Louisiana if they didn't co if they weren't forced to cover wind, uh, wind, hail, hail flood. flood. And I'm like, well, that, all it leaves is fire. Right. Exactly. So exactly. I mean, you only leave one thing left on the entire policy is fire. So um, you know, that kind of shows you where we are as a market. Um, Commissioner Donlin wanted to go to a special session to see what we can do to try and um, bolster the insurance market, encourage people to come in. The Governor Edwards said that he doesn't like the idea of a special session, but he does want to use the upcoming regular session uh, to address those kind of concerns. Is that statewide or is that just below I-10 or I-12? Uh, it's, it's statewide. And the reason why it's statewide is because insurance companies look at the state whether they're going to come or not. Um, so they may have better prices in Shreveport, but you're, you're really not going to see the kind of competitive marketplace that you need to get really good rates um, with as few insurers as we have in the state. Right. So uh, it's definitely a statewide issue. So we're unique in a lot of ways, but we're not unique when it comes to hurricanes. Florida's had their share. Texas has had their share. Why do they seem to be have they, they have more insurance companies, seems like, than when we are? Yeah, and look, I mean, a lot of the issue is, well, first of all, you got a lot of probably uh, properties in Florida and Texas that insurance companies want to write. I mean, it's a, it's a more affluent, higher, yeah. higher end right. state, and there's a lot more people. So they can spread out their risk amongst a lot of people as opposed to Louisiana. Um, and then also, I think we could do a better job from an insurance commissioner uh, standpoint. Now, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, most states don't have insurance uh, elected insurance commissioner and it's te technically an appointed position um, i get myself into trouble by talking about this <laughs> but most places don't have an elected one and that the reason why they don't is because they don't want politics involved and having a political person i'm not blaming commissioner Donlin, but having somebody who can accept, accept campaign contributions from insurance companies some you know who's making decisions based off of his next re-election cycle I don't think is necessarily in the best interest of the state. Yeah, and, and not saying anything about Donald, but I think we had three or four in a row that ended up in trouble. Right. The <laughs> so. bar in Louisiana is, did he go to jail? And that's a terrible bar right. to judge your insurance commissioner on. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of sad when you make that joke, but that's, yeah. that's the reality of it. And yeah. I think if you go to an appointed position, like most states, we're one of nine. If I, it's nine or 11, I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's a very minority of states that do that. And look, you saw it. I will pick on one decision uh, Commissioner Donlin made after Ida, which was insurance companies, I think with State Farm, had it in their policies that uh, they were not going to reimburse you for travel expenses if you weren't having an emergency declaration. And then New Orleans, the mayor didn't issue an emergency declaration, so State Farm was not going to pay. Well, 
Dolan came in and said, well, no, they, 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 you have to pay. State Farm object to it. But the problem with that is insurance companies don't want to deal with that kind of uncertainty. You know, if you make the rule on the front end right. that you have to cover this, then that's fine. They, they will play by the rules. But you can't go after the fact and change rules. Did it really benefit the people? No. And I'll tell you why. It's because State Farm is going to get the money from me and you. Exactly. It's, they're going to raise rates. They're going to raise rates to make up the difference. So right. I think what uh, Commissioner Dolan did in that incident, inc incident was he did something that sounded good to the public. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make them pay for your travel, right. even though you didn't have an emergency declaration. Stand up for you. Right. Stand up for you. But what he really did was just push it on me and you shoulders. Exactly. And also angered the insurance company and said, well, we don't want to do business in Louisiana. That's how we're going to be treated. It was a win. It was a lose-lose proposition, I think, for the entire state. So a lot of people are getting those letters that they're, they're, the company's not going to share anymore, not going to do business here. And it falls to Louisiana citizens in a lot of cases. Correct. How are we solvent with Louisiana citizens? Well, right now we have money to put in there. I mean, typically the insurance companies that are here do put up money in pre premium taxes and stuff like that, and then we as, a, uh, as the legislature will back up anything that they do. We look okay on that front. I think we should probably, I think, but Donlin wants to raise rates on that as well because he's looking at the actuarial tables, right. so you're seeing that going up as well. Talking yeah. a little bit about insurance and, and, uh, and what we're doing, and you got to do have another upcoming session, which will be a fiscal session, which is always a big thing. And, and I guess part of that is the billion dollars you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So, you know, Louisiana alternates fiscal, non-fiscal years. Uh, you can do tax bills and, and, and all those kind of bills every other year. I mean, the other sessions, the general session, we can file bills on all the other tops, not fiscal. Right. So this is a fiscal session. So we can put taxes on the table. We can take taxes off the table. We can do all that structuring. And you're also limited to only five bills. So it's going to be it's a much shorter, more compacted session. It's a lot easier from a, from a legislator standpoint. Um, but it's going to be interesting because we do, like I said, have a billion dollar surplus, um, something we haven't seen since the early Jindal years. And I, I, I joke with people, but I, there is some truth to it. I think it's a lot easier to have a billion dollar, a $2 billion deficit than a billion dollar surplus because a $2 billion deficit, which, which I came into, you should tell everybody no. Like, you know, right, like, no, we can't do it. That's a great idea. We can't do that. Sorry, we don't have any money. Now it's like we have a billion dollars. People that come to you like, fast. They're, they're like, hey, man, like, we know you have it. Can you, right. can you, can you, can you? He's like, well, now I just don't like your idea. Right. And so people get upset by that. I was just trying that. to be nice. I was just trying to be nice <laughs> earlier. Um, and so that's kind of where we find ourselves in. And, you know, the, the governors put teacher pay raise uh, back on the table. We've, we've done three of them, I think, since I've been there. Uh, we've been trying to move towards the southern average. The concern we're having, though, is, and I, I'm not saying we're, we're against it, the concern is that this is going to be a recurring expense. We're not sure how much longer this kind of money we'll be seeing for is going to be there. We don't want to overcommit ourselves to a bunch of reoccurring expenses and then not have the money. And then we're like seven years down the line and then you see a big hole. And like we did, it was a repeat of the Jindal administration where right. this, you create a hole in deficit and you got to cut higher education or health care. <laughs> so that's kind of where we are as far as that goes. But then you're going to, so we're going to see a lot of the billion dollars spent on infrastructure. I mean, that's, it's a good way to put it because, you know, it's not a reoccurring expense. It's a hard cost. You know, you can do it. Um, a lot of the universities, LSU and Nichols, and other ones too, have huge deferred maintenance costs. They've been, you know, it's in, it's, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I think we're going to start trying to chip away at it last time. I think we're going to keep trying to chip away in this deferred maintenance cost, which is just stuff they need to do around their campuses that they've been not doing for 50 years. Um, and it adds up. Right. There's a whole bunch of stuff. We probably could talk all day about all, oh, yeah. the, all the way we're going to spend the money. Yeah, right? I bet you a lot of people would line up to, to get that money for sure. Hey, you talk about infrastructure, and, and we, we just had trillions now. I, like, I don't even know what comes after trillions. When you talk about the federal government now, we went right, we blew right by billions into trillions and whatever's next. I've seen Joe Biden in front of the bridge in Calcasieu Parish right there in Lake Charles acting like, we're going to get a new one right there. Right. Obviously. The, so how much, I guess what I'm trying to say, how much from the from the big infrastructure bill coming to the feds are we going to be at, adding on to that? And I guess a lot of those are co-payments almost? Yeah, well, they all require state matches. Right. I mean, and, and these, and the, the, the difficult thing is, um, is every, with the inflationary costs, all these projects are doubling and tripling in cost. Sure. And I'll give you an example. I get a lot of phone calls from Robbins Canal Bridge. People, when is it going to be replaced? The problem with that bridge is from the time that we awarded it and everything else, the cost doubled. 
Yeah. So it went from like a one point five yeah. million dollar bridge to three million dollar bridge. So the state's waiting a year to let the money come back in. So we'll, that project will happen next year because they needed the money. Even that little small bridge, you multiply it out towards a big bridge in sure. Calcasieu and Baton Rouge. So even though you get money from the from the feds, it's not as much money as you thought it was going to be relative towards the construction costs that are just completely skyrocketing right now. So I think. Um, we're going to work on that this session, and we're really, as a state, trying to build two mega projects, which is the Calcasieu Bridge, with the Biden and all that stuff, and then the <laughs> and then the Baton Rouge Bridge is also a big piece of trying to move that project along. So where as well. do they think the Baton Rouge? Because look, you cannot be from Baton Rouge and go. They need it. They need a bridge that you can't take a left, a 90 degree turn to to go across the the river right there, and, and on both ways, and, and it just backs up everything when you try and go through I-10. So they Correct. need some. Where are they, they thinking off of Highway 30 and go yes. through St. Gabriel? Maybe? That's where they're. That's one of them. I think the it's not the finalist spot, but I think there's like three locations they've they've lowered they've um, kind of finalized it towards going. But that's one of the ones for sure. And that would go all the way to I-10 and Correct. connect. It wouldn't just stop at LA-1. Right Correct. There, right? And the idea is to try and get people off the bridge in different places so they're not Yeah, you all. could bypass New Orleans. I mean, Baton Rouge, right? If, yes. So anything coming west would just turn before you get to Baton Rouge. Correct. And you wouldn't have those trucks in downtown. That's the idea. Um, I mean, anybody drives in Baton Rouge, I mean, every time I go there, it's like, <laughs> good grief. I mean, and, and you try to find a time. It's like, <laughs> no, it's <laughs> Tuesday at right. 8 a.m. is traffic. It's Tuesday at right. 9 30 it doesn't matter when you go it's it's yeah. it's, it's land it's hard Look, when i went to college there they had this i think the same orange barrels are still on the interstate right <laughs> and they just keep they just keep doing it and, and but you have to i mean look after after Katrina, you know, it's probably doubled in size. With the population. Absolutely. And look, be, and people don't, I mean, I, I, when I say people, I, I didn't realize. I-10 is the most trafficked corridor in the United States right. from Houston to Florida. I mean, that's, sure. that is the biggest. So it's hard maintaining that sort of level. That's good for us. It's commerce. I mean, sure. everything going through there. Um, so, but it, it also comes with a lot of upkeep and a lot of expansion to try and keep that thing flowing. Right. And you look at the interstates and, and, it is important to, to do that. I mean, you kind of have that in New Orleans. you got the 610 that kind of goes around, you know, go downtown. If we could do that in Baton Rouge, it would help out Correct. a lot. Plus, it, it, would, it would move a lot of people probably over to the West Bank and, look, and help out with for that. For here in this story. region, we put a lot of money that you're going to be seeing spent on Highway 90, turning it into I-49. That's, that's a big, also important piece of the state. <laughs> During so, our lifetime? Well, look, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But we put we put a lot of money I, I into I'm those sorry. exchanges in Lafayette <laughs> yeah. is where it's at. I right. mean, those things are like a hundred yeah. million dollars right. in exchange right. to, to construct. You're like, oh my goodness! <laughs> right, and you got to do a bunch of them. You got to do a bunch of them. <laughs> All right, well, it'll Dan. be interesting to, to talk a little bit about. Uh, we got an election coming up for governor, so the the next year. Uh, John Bell Edwards is no longer there, and we've we've kind of been different than a lot of states. We've had. More of a we're more of a red state. We've had a blue governor for the last eight years. Yes. Uh, so it'd be interesting. What what do you what's your thoughts as we go into the, this election? Cycle? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I think we've, um, like you said, had a, a, a Democrat governor and Republican legislature. So it's, it's made things interesting. Had to work with people and and kind of have to. Which I don't think it's horrible, but no, you know, it, right? it keeps things right. moderate and it keeps things in the middle as, as the two sides. To me, I think it's a great checks and balances on mm -hmm. um, the way it's supposed to run, where we're checking the governor and he's checking us, and we're kind of kind of pushing and pulling. And I think we've done some good work over the years because of that tension, right. like the founders want us to do. But that's mm -hmm. going to change. I mean, I think the next governor's race, you're going to see definitely a Republican win. Um, you know, I think the, the candidates so far is really only one announced candidate, candidate was Attorney General Jeff Landry, and then you got a whole field of possibilities right now and I think the big thing that the field is waiting on is whether Senator John Kennedy is going to throw his name in the hat or not. Why does he do that? That seems like this is three years in a row I've seen him go, well, I'm going to run for governor and then he goes, eh, now I'm good. Yeah, there's there's two theories out there. I think the one theory is... Uh, Cassidy's also names have floated too. Is is I think one theory is he likes the attention and I think uh, <laughs> the other think? theory is, yeah. <laughs> The other theory is that, you know, I think he has, I think maybe really seriously looked at it and just didn't like the timing of it before. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the things that's different about D.C. where he is in legislature is when you're in the minority party in the legislature, we have to work together. The, right. it, the way the system's created here is such a localized thing. You really, <clears throat> you're really forced to work with the other side. In D.C., if you're in the minority party, right. you ain't doing anything. Right. Like, you are completely out. It's, you might as well. Just counterpunching. Yeah. Counterpunching, and I think, you know, uh, there was the expectation that, 
the Republicans were going to win the House, and then that didn't happen. And so well, they won the House. I mean, right, they won the Senate, Senate right, but then yeah. that didn't happen. He's looking at you know six years of, right. of not being as influential as you'd want to be. We can come back here, and he's. I, I, nobody's going to accuse him of being. I'm not saying he's old. He's not a spring chicken, right? right. I mean, I, um, and so he. I think this is his last chance to make his mark in Louisiana. Yeah, I know. He won by like probably what 80, 82 percent or something, yeah, which was a crazy number when you talk about running number. for a statewide office like and, that. And look, he's been he's been involved in state politics since the early eighties. I mm -hmm. mean, um, he was he in was the Secretary of State. He was in the Romer administration. Right. He was executive counsel for for Romer. I mean, he's. He he know he's probably forgotten more sure. state government than I than I've learned in my last eight years. So I mean he's definitely somebody who, who's been around. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that, that does. Now I know you were also involved in redistricting. Well, you guys seem to have gotten at least through the election cycle, but that may we may see that again depending on what happens in. A, a yeah, I mean we we the congressional races happened, so you know we were able to uh, our plan our thing. Uh, you know, was was used again, and it was thing. You know, it, to me, that thing was very interesting because the, the plan that we pa a actually passed was the same plan that Louisiana used during the Obama administration that Eric Holder signed off on. Mm -hmm. So the the Democratic presidents and his attorney general both signed off on this plan. Suddenly, you know, this plan became controversial years later. I just think it's a sign of the times. Sure. It wasn't controversial ten years ago. Also, became controversial mm -hmm. now. Um, and I think it's it's a plan that look no plan is perfect by any stretch of imagination, right. but given the realities of what Louisiana looks like and our, it's it's the best one we could come up. With. Yeah, no, it just seemed, it seemed a little different, and and I'm sure they they like to use that as weapons against Louisiana, Alabama, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, like yeah, you it's, know, it's it's a difficulty, and you, you know you, the way the populations are centered in Louisiana, it's different than what you'd expect. It's not. They're not as spread out as you'd like them to be to do different things. And the reality is, is that everybody would like a new con would like an mm -hmm. additional congressman. I mean, we lost ours the last time, the exact same plan. Sure. Um, and it's it's there's there's we just don't have the population base to support what we really need geographically and maybe uh, demographically as well. Yeah, uh, you know, it seems like we, we talk to everybody that comes here is like, oh, two years of COVID. You know, it was just. I was, I, terrible time for everyone right into a storm and it did seem like 22 was like an optimistic like hey let's get back there and do those things so 23 you see more of the same that that we're going to be headed in a, in the right direction yeah we're looking great i mean i think the state has not looked as good in a long time i mean really um our our our, our higher education is funded at a at where it's supposed to be um Healthcare is never what you want it to be, but as far as there's, we're not looking at shutting we're not anything, closing not, hospitals. We're not closing hospitals. You know, one of the great success stories of Louisiana the last couple of years, we didn't close a single rural hospital in eight years. At the same time, I think Mississippi closed six of them. I mean, when you talk about access to care, a rural hospital is a big deal. I mean, at, at the hmm. end of the day, that's a we 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 you might not always like the way the stew is made, but we were able to keep that. Right. And I think that's something that uh, one of the untold non-sexy stories is how we kept a lot of facilities open in Louisiana when other states were not, were not able to. Yeah, and, and I, I guess that all comes from, you know, the Medicaid, what the decision, what we're going to do on that, you know, Obamacare, that kind of stuff. So that, that all plays politically down the road and has ripples into everybody's uh, 100%. community, you know. So, yeah. Uh, it was good to keep uh, O'Shaber, although, you know, so it seemed like Obamacare was against what our state was, the way we had the charity system right. set up. And it was look, a little different. This yeah. is not what you, the question you asked, but I right. threw it out there just because we were talking about wrap up. Louisiana moved out the bottom 10 on business tax climate la this year. So this will be our first year we're out of the bottom 10 since I've been there. We've been working really yeah. hard to change the way that Louisiana is perceived nationally. And so, I mean, we look like we're open for business more than we ever have been, um, probably in the history of the state. And yeah. that's stuff that's been. You know, they don't they don't put you in front of the home courier for right. moved out the bottom ten. That doesn't <laughs> we're really, number forty eight. Yeah, we're number forty eight. Uh, well, right. Yeah, no, but I, I mean it's 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 definitely something that we're shows progress. Now, yeah, right? we're not in the top 10, bottom ten. Yeah, we're not in bottom ten anymore. I mean, you know, it's 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 progress. It's not where we want to be, but it's progress. Well, Tanner, we really sure appreciate your time, man. Thank you. Thanks I for the, being here. All right, we'll be right back with more body time after this.